The rapture is an event that has captured the imagination of many Christians for generations. Of recent, it has been the subject of many popular books, movies, and television programs. Without going into too much detail, the timing of the rapture and its nature have been and continue to be the subject of much debate among the church. Common to many of these views are the ideas that 1. the rapture will precede the second coming of Christ, and 2. that the purpose of the rapture is the deliverance of God's people from the earth. These views are what is espoused in the aforementioned types of Christian media, and they have largely served to influence the contemporary views of believers about the end times. With all of that being said, are these assumptions about the rapture actually what Paul was intending to communicate? Let's look at both of these assumptions one at a time. The rapture is described by the Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. First, what is the context of the Lord's descent from heaven described in verse 16? Prior to chapter 4, Paul makes earlier references in 1 Thessalonians to the coming of Christ. He establishes the theme of his letter in chapter 1. His desire is to encourage the believers in Thessalonica to persevere in their faith in spite of the tribulations they have come to face. As a part of his encouragement, Paul makes reference to Jesus coming from heaven in verse 10, quote, who rescues us from the wrath to come. Furthering his encouragement, Paul makes a second reference to the coming of Christ in chapter 2, verse 19. The word translated as coming is the Greek word parousia. Paul's use of this word gives us some clues as to the context of the coming he is referencing. Parousia specifically refers to a conquering appearance of a royal figure. It was often used in the Roman world, of which the New Testament writers were a part, in reference to the return of the imperial army to the city at the conclusion of a victorious campaign. Paul again refers to Christ's parousia in chapter 3 verse 13. His description of Christ's parousia is with reference to his coming to claim what is rightfully his, the everlasting kingdom of all nations and peoples. In the same way that the Roman emperor's parousia was his return to his place of rule over his domain, so Christ's parousia is his return to his place of rule over all the earth. The important point to emphasize here is that a parousia implies that the ruler will not be leaving again, as a parousia occurs at the close of a campaign. Thus, we can see that Paul is not referring to a time when Christ will disappear again. He is referring to Christ's final appearing. Returning to chapter 4, this is the nature of the coming of the Lord described in verse 15. To be frank, there is no passage here in 1 Thessalonians or anywhere else in the Bible that describes a coming of Christ after which he will then leave the world behind for a time. My contention, and that of those who would agree with me, is that Paul is not referring to an event of this kind. Rather, he is referring to Christ's second advent, when he will return to judge the world. This moves us to consider the second assumption, that the rapture is an event in which believers will be removed from the earth. Substance to this position is the reference to the dead and living in Christ being, quote, caught up together in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, in chapter 4, verse 17. Surely this is a plain reference to God's people being delivered from the earth, isn't it? Given that the context of this event is Christ's parousia, his royal return to claim and judge the earth, we must interpret verse 17 within this framework. During an imperial parousia, the army would camp a short distance outside of the city gates, in which time an envoy would be sent ahead to let the officials and citizens know of their return. While the army was encamped, the city would prepare a great celebration for their victorious campaign. Once the city was ready, a procession would be sent out to meet the emperor, which would then accompany him and the rest of the army into the city. Recall that Daniel described the Son of Man in his vision as coming with the clouds of heaven as he received his eternal kingdom. Recall also that Jesus quoted this verse in reference to himself before Caiaphas at his trial. The references to clouds in these contexts is not with respect to physical clouds. Rather, it is Old Testament imagery used to delineate the authority and power of God. I believe that Paul is using this reference to clouds and air in the same way. He is not saying that we're all going to float up into the sky as if we've suddenly become weightless. He is using this language to describe the church's accompanying of Christ as he claims his kingdom at the last day. Thus, the reference to believers meeting Christ in the clouds and the air is not so that they would depart from the earth, but rather that they would accompany Christ in victory over the powers of evil. Hence, why Paul states, quote, the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints in chapter 3, verse 13. 
Despite the influence of some Christian media, there is no chance in this sequence of events that a true believer will be, quote, left behind, or otherwise separated from Christ and his people. There will also not be the sudden, widespread disappearance of Christians from earthly existence. The rapture is an event that coincides with the second coming of Christ. It is the event in which Christ will visibly claim the earth for himself and all of his people. There will be no tribulation or persecution left for believers to endure. It will be the beginning of the eternal state of the new heaven and the new earth.